Grand round number 16 uh, from the Subang Jaya Medical Center cardiology team and uh, guest nephrologist. So uh, before I hand over to the moderator of today's session, who is none other than Dr. Kanan, let me just go through some housekeeping slides. Okay. So uh, like usual, the this. Uh, event uh, is claimable for CBD points and it will be only through QR code uh, which will be displayed at the end of the talk. So please scan this with your MMA app when we display it. All right, and the display will be uh, at the uh, blank uh, slide here which will fill it with the QR code. We are not using Slido today, so uh, please. Uh, um, Place your questions and comments either in the Facebook group or through YouTube when you're watching and we'll highlight your question for the uh, speakers, okay? So uh, without further ado, I'm going to remove myself and uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Kanan and uh, I'm going to switch to his slide. So Kanan, over to you, yeah? Can I hear? Tell how to tell. And then there's no sound. Uh, okay. Sorry, Craig. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I start again. All right. Can uh, you start sorry, again? there was a little bit of a technical problem, so we're going to start again. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for another one of our webinars from the Subangaya Medical Center. The topic of conversation this afternoon is cardiorenal syndrome. My panelists this afternoon need little introduction. We have senior consultant nephrologist. Dr. Prasad Menon, we have got Dr. Shamrus Khan, uh, our consultant cardiologist. We are being ambitious. We are hoping to pre uh, present three interesting cases to you all. So uh, let's get going so that uh, we save on time. Um, Dr. Prasad, the first question to you. Can you please explain to us what is cardiorenal syndrome? Thank you, Dr. Kanan. Now, 
Cardiorenal syndrome is defined as a spectrum of disorders involving both the heart and the kidneys, where acute dysfunction of one organ, acute or chronic dysfunction of one organ will lead to acute or chronic dysfunction of the other organ. Uh, this is an example of the crosstalk that occurs between the various organs. Can I have the next slide? Right. Okay, if this on the on the left of your screen, you'll see the uh, caricature of the heart and on the right, the kidneys. Now, there are many similarities between the heart and the kidneys. For example, both of them have are supplied by the sympathetic nervous system as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, both these organs are richly vascular. In fact, the kidney being slightly more vascular than the heart which is not surprising considering that at any one time, 20% of your blood is actually circulating to these two small kidneys, which is responsible for cleansing the blood. Now, together, the heart and the kidneys regulate your blood pressure. They are involved in the regulation of vascular tone and also in diuresis and natriuresis. So your body volume hem homeostasis is actually controlled by the heart and the kidneys. Of course, the kidneys will not work if the heart doesn't pump blood into the kidneys. That's also uh, it responsible for the peripheral tissue perfusion as well as oxygenation. So in response to the title of the talk, we are we are friends, huh, Prasad? You, me, and Chambus, we are not uh, enemies. We are, not, we are not foes, we are not enemies. <laughs> okay. Dr. Prasad, is there a classification for cardiorenal syndrome? Yes, Kanan, there is. And this is uh, the latest classification where there are five types of uh, cardiorenal syndrome. Type 1 is the acute cardiorenal syndrome where you have heart failure resulting in kidney injury or kidney failure. And the examples are given here on the right side. The most common example you can say is acute decompensated heart failure. In type 2 uh, cardiorenal syndrome, the patient suffers from chronic, uh, heart, uh, is a chronic cardiorenal syndrome where chronic heart failure results in chronic kidney disease. So it's a much more slower process and therefore the kidney disease is also slower. In type 3, which is an acute renal cardiac syndrome where failure of the kidneys results in heart failure. And in type 4, you have a chronic renal cardiac syndrome where there's chronic kidney disease resulting in chronic heart failure. And this we will, for example, uremic cardiomyopathy, which we will discuss later based on one of our cases. And type 5 is where you, it's known as a secondary cardiorenal syndrome where you have both the kidneys and the heart fails together and is usually due to a systemic cause. And the most common example that we see in hospitals, I'm sure Shamrus, et cetera, would, uh, would all would agree, is septicemia and septic shock. So where one uh, systemic cause causes uh, failure of both the organs. Are there prognostic differences in the subsets of chronic renal syndrome, Prasad? Yes, uh, obviously, as the, as it or becomes obvious to anyone, anybody who has chronic kidney disease or chronic heart failure, the prognosis will be pure, pure, uh, will be poorer. When this is acute heart failure and you get acute kidney injury, usually they are quite reversible. You treat the heart failure and they get better. You get acute kidney injury and leading heart failure, the kidney function improves, then the heart failure will also improve. Also, persons in patients, uh, we know that if those who have heart failure, for example, in which there's a marked rise in the creatinine of more than and a heart, uh, of more than fifty percent drop in EGFR, they have a poorer prognosis. And taking from there, Dr. Prasad, before we go on to the cases, can you give us a quick overview of the pathophysiology of the cardiorenal syndrome? Sure, Ganan. Um, now, if you look at this uh, slide, uh, this will tell you about the, on the left you have the heart and on the right you have the kidney. Now, the, let's look at the top part of it. This is arterial underfilling. This is the low flow hypothesis where when the heart, the pump failure occurs, the heart does not pump blood. 
through the kidney. So that's a decrease in cardiac output leading to a decrease in effective circulating volume and therefore a decrease in the renal blood flow and renal plasma flow. <clears throat> Obviously, when there's a, the blood flow through the kidneys is diminished, you can know that the afferent arterial, there is a, and near the glomerulus, there's a, a cluster of cells called the juxta glomerular apparatus. And what happens is that when there's flow through there is diminished, it releases a hormone called renin, which then sets into cascade with this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Also, when you have heart failure, of course, the sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive because it needs this positive inotropic and chronotropic effects, trying to get the heart to pump together. And also, lastly, there are a lot of inflammatory cytokines which are released, for example, tumor necrosis factor. So this forms a cascade here, you can see, and it's all due to pump failure of the heart. Now, other than arterial underfilling, if you look at the bottom part of the slide, you see that there's also venous congestion. That is, because there's pump failure, the blood flow that is coming back to the heart is also compromised, and therefore you find there's congestion of the vein. And this is clinically manifested. When you look at the JVP, the jugular venous pressure is high, the, there's peripheral edema. All these are signs of venous congestion. And this leads to uh, raised in the intra-abdominal uh, pressure. Now, once there's a rise in the intra-abdominal pressure, you'll find that the pressure in the veins of the kidney is also high. So now you have a poor blood flow coming from here, from the artery and the vein, the pressure is high. What happens? The glomerular filtration, the filtration pressure is reduced and therefore the GFR drops. There's also interstitial edema of the kidneys will occur in such an instance. And also like above, you'll see that there's also activation of the renin angiotensin and sympathetic nervous system. And these are actually uh, a consequence of what happens above. So when the kidney, on, on the other hand, when there is a problem with the kidney, the kidney, uh, you get acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, there's a drop in EGFR, Sodium and water excretion is therefore limited and there's, there's sodium and water retention in the body causing increased edema, increased preload and on an increased load on the heart and therefore also then causing heart failure. So this looks like a bidirectional relationship. Okay, with that uh, good revision given to us by Prasad, we are ready to tackle the cases. Uh, all the cases were seen in our hospital and managed by all of us. The first case was seen on the 8th of October 2021, 88-year-old male who had had hypertension for about four years but refused to take treatment. He was brought to see us because he had chest pain on exertion, the duration of which was unclear. He also complained of passing urine frequently at night. Clinical examination revealed the elevated blood pressure 170 by 90. The pulse rate was unremarkable, it was regular. Examination of the heart revealed a grade 2 by 6 mitral valve prolapse murmur in the, in the mitral area. The rest of the cardiac examination was normal. The rest of the physical examination was normal. So I'll go on to show the ECG. And Dr. Shambros, the ECG is a bit blur, but uh, so, uh, can you please interpret the ECG first? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Kanan. Hi, everyone. So the ACD showed sinus rhythm, but the most obvious changes are the ST depression in the inferior lateral leads, as far as I can see. Okay, thank you, Shamru. So it indicates ischemia, and going by its history, we are not surprised. So we did this echocardiogram, and uh, the echocardiogram is a uh, left ventricle, is aorta, aortic valve, left atrium, mitral valve. You can see the left ventricle is squeezing very well. It's another view of the left of the, uh, of the heart, the echocardiogram. This is the left ventricle, and you can see that squeezing very well. So we admitted him. We gave him antihypertensive therapy. The next day, the ECG had normalized. We thought that uh, this man had significant coronary artery disease, advised him to undergo angiography. 
but because he was 88, he refused to have this done. Because of his uh, urinary complaints, he got a urology consult. He was seen by Dr. Kalei Selvam, who, who examined him and said that his prostate was quite big and that there was urinary retention and that he required an indwelling catheter. Uh, placement of the indwelling catheter resulted in the release of quite a lot of uh, retained urine, about 700 mils. As I remember, I've showed you the echocardiogram. With all this, the patient felt much better and he went home with the indwelling catheter. He was seen a week later in the follow-up clinic. He said his chest pain was virtually gone. He could walk more now. He refused to have angiograms done, but he was mainly troubled by the indwelling catheter. This is his ECG the day after admission, and you can see that the ST segment depression that Shamrus pointed out to us earlier is all gone. It looks quite normal. Two weeks later, he came to our emergency room and with complaints of 24 hours of progressive breathlessness. He denied any chest pain, he denied any sudden sweating. Blood pressure was 180 by, uh, sorry, 110 by 80. His heart rate was a bit fast at 90 per minute. It was, however, regular. Examination of the heart did not reveal anything significant. The murmur was quite soft now. But in the lungs, there were bibasilar crepitations. And Dr. Shamros, do you think, what do you think happened to the patient? I mean, uh, given the comorbidities and the clinical presentation, looked like he was in a bit of a heart failure clinically. I would like to make sure that he didn't have any acute coronary syndrome as a trigger for his current presentation. Okay, so we did ECG, yeah. Okay, so we did an ECG, and maybe you interpret this for us, Shamrus. I mean. It seems that the ST depression that we saw uh, on the first ECG was much worse this time. So I'm sure yes. something has happened to trigger the current presentation. The cardiac okay. markers also I noticed were elevated. So yeah. it probably had an uh, acute coronary syndrome to trigger the okay. current presentation. Okay, the R waves too from V1, V2 and V3 are quite uh, low in voltage, right? Very small. Um, so small R waves. So sometimes when you see this, this is suggestive of completed Entroceptor infarction, and as Shambhus pointed out, his cardiac markers are elevated. Yeah. So, Shambhus, this is the man's a chest x ray, looks quite dramatic. <clears throat> the x ray on admission was normal. Can you just uh, point out the salient features to us? Yeah, I mean, this is an AP film, so obviously you can't really assess the heart size accurately, but despite that, it looks a bit enlarged, and then you can see all these uh, congestive changes in the hyla region consistent with. Uh, Acute pulmonary edema. Okay, this man was certainly in pulmonary edema. So we did this echocardiogram again, and this time you can see clearly that the anterior wall is no longer moving. It's another view of the, the echocardiogram. This whole anterior wall is no longer moving. So this man obviously has suffered a an entroceptral myocardial infarction resulting in left ventricular failure. So he needed admission to our coronary care unit urgently. He was noted to be severely hypoxic. He had sinus tachycardia. Blood pressure was lowish at 100 by 80. Oxygen saturation was low, 91%, in spite of face mask at 10 liters per minute. And then he required bi uh, BiPAP ventilation. I gave him uh, intravenous furosemide, 40 milligrams bolus on two occasions. In spite of this, the urine output was poor. Two questions to you, Dr. Prasad. Could you explain to us the reason for the patient's suboptimal response to furosemide. <clears throat> Next question, uh, if I can just say, uh, uh, introduce it now itself, what treatment options are available to induce a diuresis in case bolus uh, furosemide does not work? Uh, what could help us reduce the pulmonary congestion in this patient? Right. Uh, thanks, Kanan. Uh, looking at the first uh, thing, uh, he was given furosemide and it didn't seem to have any effect. Now, first of all, uh, one has to look back. I mean, in this case, the patient was not on furosemide before. Was he Kanan? No. No, he was not. No, he did not so, require it. So actually, the, then when you give him IV furosemide, 40 million, there should have been some effect. But unfortunately, this gentleman does not, did not have. But if they had been on furosemide before, then when you... Give them a full year to give them a much higher dose, at least two and a half times what it was on before, what the patient was on before. Now, if 
uh, it, it doesn't work either the dose was inadequate you cannot talk about absorption because it is given intravenously or sometimes they have something what is known as a post diuretic effect don't forget that fusamide is a short acting drug and only lasts for 4 to 6 hours and subsequently sometimes it, it has an initial effect but subsequently the the kidney then starts reabsorbing more sodium and water and negates what happened before and this has been known to uh, known to occur so to to try and get rid of that phenomenon we can try either frequent bolus doses or try an intravenous infusion of a diuretic um, in this case you use your loop diuretic fusamide you run it an intravenous infusion and the rate will depend upon the kidney function of course if your kidney function is more impaired you may need a higher dose sometimes what the other do is to in addition of a diuretic which acts at a site remote from the loop diuretic and that will help to prevent any reabsorption of sodium and water at a site distal to the loop of Henley. Okay, thank you Prasad. Uh, I think this diagram illustrates some of the points that Prasad made. Maybe we move on the interest of time here yeah, Prasad. Yeah, so the patient yeah. was started, patient was started an intravenous frismite infusion we also gave him half a tablet of apoamylozide, 50 stroke 5. With this measure, he had a prisdiuresis and progressively improved. Uh, two questions again, Dr. Prasad. This is an example of cardiorenal syndrome. And could you explain to us how apoamylozide augments the, the diuretic effect of fluismine? Maybe I'll go back on the previous slide so you have the diagram to show. Let's right. Go. If I can ask, so I can I answer the second question first. If you look at this, yeah. these are the sites of action. Uh, proximal conventula, you have astrozolomide, then uh, mannitol acts in the proximal PCT as well as in the loop of Henley. The main diuretic we all use is the loop diuretic, which acts in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henley. Then distal to that, in the distal convoluted tubule, you find you can use uh, your thiazide diuretics are effective uh, in blocking uh, absorption of sodium and uh, chloride. And lastly, the collecting duct, your mineral corticoid receptor blockers. So if you use, for example, in this case, if you use a loop diuretic, it'll cause sodium and water to be not absorbed, it'll go down. But sometimes, as I mentioned, these, these two areas will then avidly reabsorb sodium and water. So to prevent that, if you block the uh, apoamylozide, has or the hydrochlorothiazide as well as amyloride, so you are blocking at these two sites remote from where the loop diuretic is action. So it all gets causes a synergistic effect in diuresis, and you find that the um, you get a better uh, urine output, better diuresis, and better way to decongest the patient. Okay, um, can I move forward? And, yes, okay. yes. Is this an example of the cardiorenal syndrome? Definitely, this is cardiorenal syndrome type one, where pump failure causes uh, acute kidney injury. And... Okay, we'll move on, Prasad. So this, I, I put here serially the changes in uh, renal function during this patient's admission. And uh, Dr. Prasad, could you comment on the change of renal parameters in this patient? Uh, thanks. Uh, you can see that the creatinine has gone up uh, a little bit and then it is normalized. The GFR has dropped from 55 down to 30, 40, and then come back up to 54.3. So this patient had acute, uh, well, what should I say, worsening of renal function. And this worsening of renal function is because of the diuresis. Uh, worsening of renal fun function that occurs uh, with diuresis, with decongestive symptoms, actually can, do not carry an adverse prognosis. On the other hand, if you have worsening renal function, uh, without decongestion, and that usually spells more trouble. Subsequently, we found that this patient was very sensitive to diuretics. Even 12.5 milligrams of spironolactone induced a lot of urine output. Uh, Amphagliflozin, 12.5 milligrams was introduced. He improved and he was discharged ambulant and well, and his discharge medications were a small, uh, I mean, his blood pressure was borderline 100 to 110. So candisartan, 4 milligrams to offload him, amphagliflozin, 12.5 milligrams once a day, and spironolactone, 12.5 milligrams once a day. Dr. Shambrus, can you explain to us the role of 
SGLT2 inhibitors, an example of which is sempaglutazine in the treatment of heart failure in general and in non-diabetics in particular. Okay, I mean, briefly, this is actually a type of medication that we normally use in diabetes patients. But in the recent uh, European uh, heart failure guidelines, it has actually been included as part of a heart failure treatment in a patient with reduced ejection fraction. Um, I mean, it has been shown across multiple studies to reduce uh, heart failure, hospitalization, as well as cardiovascular mortality. So nowadays, we try and incorporate this type of medications into heart failure treatment. It doesn't matter whether they have diabetes or not. We try and introduce this kind of medication very early at the beginning of the uh, management, especially in patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure, regardless of their diabetic status. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shamrus. Uh, Dr. Prasad, should we worry when a patient has excessive diuresis when treating cardiorenal syndrome? And the next question is, this patient had impaired renal function. Is this a contraindication to using SGLT2 inhibitors? If you use SGLT2 inhibitors in this patient, are there any precautions to take? All right. Uh, thanks, Kanan. <clears throat> um, Obviously, if the patient has an excessive diuresis, if you can just show me the next slide. Yeah. If the patient has excessive diuresis, then there may be a drastic drop in intravascular volume. And this will lead to pseudo worsening of renal function or true acute kidney injury. Um, can I just uh, tell you what the differences between the two are? If you go to the next slide. So next slide, please. Okay. Worsening of renal function is seen in about 21 to 60 percent of all patients. So when you treat acute decompensated heart failure with diuretics, you can actually expect the creatinine to go up a little bit because that's what happens when you uh, when a patient has a diuresis, the intravascular volume contracts, some uh, reduction in blood flow to the kidney, and you get some so-called worsening of renal function. But when there's true worsening of renal function or Acute kidney injury, this occurs due to severe hypoperfusion when there's bad congestion, especially of the venous system. When you use nephrotoxins, for example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which are on board and not taken off, or patient becomes septic, then you can develop an acute kidney injury. And this next, can I, uh, this will definitely be associated with increased morbidity and mortality. On the other hand, you what we call a pseudo worsening of renal function occurs with the use of diuretics, occurs with the use uh, is associated with hemoconcentration. So there's when there's, there's hemoconcentration leads to a decrease in the congestive symptoms. Can also occur due to RAS blockers. We know that when you block use uh, block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the um, creatinine does go up by 20%, which is unacceptable. And in these kind of patients, there's in fact no increase in morbidity and mortality. And in fact, they actually do better because there's better decongestion of the body. So this is a, a, little, a few words on what happens with worsening of renal function in patients uh, with acute decompensated heart failure. Um, as far as the SGLT2 is concerned, uh, if you look at the top, SGLT2, uh, as Shamru has already mentioned that it is no more now considered a diabetic, it's a, well, a diabetic drug, but it's also considered as a cardiovascular drug. Uh, it's used in uh, patients with heart failure, with uh, reduced, or even now some of them, the new study shows it's even a preserved cardiac function. It's also used for chronic kidney disease. The DAPA CKD study shows that, you know, using usage of this can actually help. And you can see this is where the SGLT2 acts in the proximal part of the uh, nephron. So you can actually use it. The indication has uh, been, been extended to even use in patients with EGFR as low as 20 mils per minute. Do you have to monitor the renal function, Prasad, if you use these drugs? Yes, you have to, especially if the patient is on a lot of diuretics. Because di uh, with the diuretics, you get contraction of intravascular volume. And if you add on uh, SGLT2, it also causes a natriuresis, a loss of sodium, because it, and it acts at this part. 
so you can get excessive uh, loss of uh, sodium and this may lead to uh, hypovolemia and hypotension in patients so you have to be you have to monitor them quite closely okay thank you prasad let's move on to case 2 uh, this is a patient that dr prasad and i looked after now this gentleman was 44 years old male he had diabetes hypertension and stage renal failure in april of 2018 he presented with breathlessness clinical examination revealed that his jugular venous pressure was markedly elevated up the angle of the jaw his blood pressure was elevated 140 by 100 pulse rate was 72 per minute and he was on some beta blockers he was also noted to be very pale in the heart we could hear a pericardial rock in the lungs there were bilateral basal crepitations uh, the abdomen uh, the liver was enlarged so all signs of uh, congestive heart failure hemoglobin was very low at 6.9 his urea and creatinine were markedly elevated urea was 41 the creatinine was 1364 the ecg was not very remarkable but the x-ray was Unfortunately, I couldn't get the old chest x-rays that this man had. This is taken from a CT scan of his lung that was done as part of its evaluation. And uh, what we see is that he has got bilateral pleural effusion. On the left side, you see more effusion than on the right side. You see there is uh, increased vascular marking, so there's some pulmonary congestion. And what's important is the heart is quite globular, suggesting that... Uh, he may have a pericardial effusion, what they call a silhouette sign. You can see this clear little demarcation between the congestion and the uh, heart shadow. And uh, this is his echocardiogram. Uh, again, left ventricle, aorta, left atrium. This little space is the pericardial space. You can see pericardial effusion here. And it's important to note that his left ventricle systolic function is very poor. I think it was measured to be about 25%. Any, another view of the left ventricle, again, you see the contraction is globally reduced uh, and uh, there is this pericardial effusion again. So, Dr. Shamrus, uh, could you, uh, why could this, what, can we have some reasons as to why this man has reduced left ventricular systolic function? What could the reason or reasons be? I mean, um... I mean, he's quite young, but he has multiple comorbidities. I mean, he's diabetic, hypertensive, diabetic can also cause cardiomyopathy, hypertensive, hypertension can also cause cardiomyopathy. And obviously, he's got end renal failure, and this can also cause, you know, cardiorenal syndrome or renal cardio syndrome. So there's multiple reasons why uh, this gentleman might have uh, reduced LV systolic function. Obviously, we also need to exclude coronary artery disease as a cause for his uh, LV systolic Okay, he has got several reasons. Uh, Dr. Prasad, do you have anything to add? Uh, yep, I think I'd like to echo what uh, uh, Shamrus has said. First of all, uh, one thing to remind all of us, cardio, chronic kidney disease is itself a cardiovascular risk factor. If you look at all our patients with CKD and follow them up, only about 20% of them will actually progress to ESKD, end-stage kidney disease, and go on dialysis. 80% of them will die along the way with some, of some cardiovascular disease. Shamru's already mentioned about hypertension and hypertensive heart disease, which is common in these patients. Um, who, most of our CKD patients have hypertension. Anemia, as in this patient, is HB of 6.9. Uh, anemia will cause uh, increased contraction of heart, left ventricular hypertrophy and so on. Volume overload, especially in the interdialytic phase, may lead to further weakening of the heart. In CKD patients, they have high phosphatemia, which leads to increased vascular calcification. And lastly, as uh, Shamrus has mentioned, in uh, patients with high urea, etc., in this patient, the urea is very high in spite of him being on dialysis, and that can lead to a uremic cardiomyopathy. So there's a whole uh, gamut of causes uh, of uh, patients in this patient, why they have this so-called chronic renal cardiac syndrome, which is what this gentleman had. Thank you, Prasad. So this patient was started on regular dialysis, and with the dialysis alone, his pericardial effusion resolved. We did not have to tap him. As the patient was planned for, cardiac, uh, for a renal transplant, coronary angiograms were done, and surprisingly, she did not have any coronary artery disease. Uh, the, uh, the, 
the reason for doing it was the poor LV function. And as Shambhus mentioned, we want to make sure it does not have any significant coronary disease, which, are, which could cause trouble if, uh, during the transplant. In September of 2019, he underwent renal transplant. And uh, again, I put the serial uh, changes in his renal uh, function. You can see during admission, uh, he, he was in severe renal failure, potassium was elevated. Then with regular dialysis over a period of about three weeks, his renal function significantly improved. And then see what happens to him. Uh, in September of 2019, he underwent renal transplant and his renal function completely became normal. In May of 2021, this gentleman came to see Prasad and complained of intermittent breathlessness at night. And when Prasad examined him, the blood pressure was normal, the heart rate was slightly elevated, but otherwise nothing much to find. Examination of the heart and lungs were clinically normal. So he rang me up and said, Kanan, I can't find anything uh, abnormal, but this man is complaining of breathlessness. Can you reassure him? So uh, he came over, when, he, when I examined him, I concurred with Prasad that there, were no, there was no evidence of heart failure and certainly all the pericardial signs that we heard earlier was gone. We did, I did a chest x-ray which was completely normal. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a chest x-ray to show you all, but we did an echocardiogram and now you see the pericardial effusion is gone. The left ventricle is squeezing very well, very good uh, ventricular system function effusion before his transplant, before his dialysis, ventricular function was poor. So this man's metabolic and hemodynamic effects brought about by renal failure, which was corrected with dialysis and renal transplant, has, has been completely uh, corrected and this has resulted in his heart function normalizing. So uh, certainly the kidney and the heart are friends. Once the kidney function normally, the heart will also function normally. But there's a sad story to this man. Uh, after going through all this and surviving all this, this poor man contracted COVID and he died. So we'll go on to the third case. Uh, we are making good time, so we can share this with you. The third, uh, third case is a 75-year-old man who's known to me and Prasad for about 20 years now. Several problems, diabetes with nephropathy, uh, hypertension and he also had coronary artery disease 20 years ago he required a stand to be placed to his right coronary artery another stand required to be put in about six years ago but otherwise he was quite well his left ventricular ejection fraction by echocardiogram was measured to be about 55 percent in 2017 he comes intermittently to see us only when he's slightly unwell now this time in december of uh, 2020 on the 15th he presented with a two-week history of reduced effort tolerance and autopnea. He denied any chest pain. Clinical examination revealed a normal blood pressure, but the heart rate was a bit fast at 100 per minute, <coughs> but it was regular to examination. Uh, I noted that he had bilateral ampullidema. I could not see his jugular venous pressure. He was quite a stocky man. Examination of the heart revealed dual sounds. There was no third heart sound. In the lungs, however, there was bilateral basal crepitations. The NT Pro BNP was elevated at 3,700. The echocardiogram now showed global left ventricular hypokinesia with the ejection fraction estimated to be about 25%. If you remember, three years earlier, it was 55%. And there was no reason to, uh, to evaluate him in, in the interim period with echocardiogram. This is the ECG we did on this gentleman. And Dr. Shamros, could you help us interpret this ECG? Uh, again, I showed a sinus rhythm. Uh, the rate is, uh, I think it was a bit fast, maybe about 100 bits per minute. Uh, small R wave, V1 to V3. There's also a widespread T inversion in the lateral leads, especially. Yeah, but otherwise, nothing very remarkable, yeah, Dr. Pra uh, Shamros? That's right, yeah. Okay. So this is the chest x-ray done in this patient uh, in 2017. Quite normal, uh, quite normal uh, sized heart and the lungs are quite clear. And this was the x-ray done during this admission. Of course, it was not, uh, not well. It was a portable film. We cannot comment on the size, but uh, in spite of it being an AP film, the heart size is quite enlarged and there is boundary congestion. So he was admitted, we started him on intravenous furosemide. He had a brisk diuresis, and with the diuresis, he felt symptomatically better. 
We are wondering what caused this man's cardiac function to deteriorate because he was quite well in between. He denied any chest pain. Uh, silent progression of his coronary artery disease was a prime suspect. However, as shown on the echocardiogram, the left ventricular hypokinesia was global rather than regional. So Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Shambrosi's question to you, could this morphological appearance of LV hypokinesia in this, man, in this patient give you any clues as to the underlying cause for the deterioration in its left ventricular systolic function? I mean, uh, generally, if it's coronary artery disease related, I mean, unless you have very diffuse left main and triple vessel disease, you can get kind of global hypokinesia as well. But usually, you will see, you will see areas of uh, hypokinesia or akinesia or thin out myocardium uh, if you think this is all related to the progression of its underlying coronary artery disease. But global, especially in thickish heart, you know, again, it could be hypertensive heart disease, uh, could also be related to other causes for cardiomyopathy, such as diabetes. You know, certainly the heart rate was a little bit fast. So, you know, sometimes very rarely you can get cardiomyopathy related to very fast heart rate as well. So you need to look into all these things. Thank you, Shamrus. So uh, two days after admission, the staff nurse called me uh, to inform me that during night rounds, the patient was noted to have a fast heart rate. They measured it at 140 per minute. They said the patient was asymptomatic, blood pressure was 110 by 80, so I had to come out from home at night to see him. We did an ECG, and Dr. Shamros, can you comment on this ECG first? Yeah, certainly the rate was faster now, and it looks irregular. I think he was in fast AF at the time. Okay, so the patient has gone into atrial fibrillation. But, uh, you know, the, the atrial fibrillation kind of helps us conduct a, a stress test for this patient, can uh, his heart rate is fast, but we don't see any ST segment depression. So you can say that he probably doesn't have any significant coronary artery disease or, uh, or at least no significant obstructive coronary artery disease. Otherwise, we may have seen some ST segment depression or elevation. Would that be right, Dr. Shambros? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So I gave him uh, intravenous amir around 300 milligrams as a bolus. And uh, he reverted to sinus rhythm about four hours later. Four days later, he complained of breathlessness and uh, his cough at rest had recurred. He was still in sinus rhythm, but the blood pressure was lowish at between 110 by 80 sitting and 100 by 80 standing. His urine output started to drop. So this was the change in renal parameters in this patient. Um, from, uh, from uh, over a period of four days, his creatinine had gone up from 157 to 332, and his EGFR had dropped from 38 to 16. So I thought that he would benefit with some inotropic support. He was uh, brought back to the coronary care unit. And over the four days, between the 20th of December to 24th of December, we noted that he was in intermittent atrial fibrillation, which we could uh, revert with intravenous amiodarone. With all these measures, he symptomatically and hemodynamically stabilized. We introduced beta blockers and could wean him off inotropes. And here I have tabulated the serial changes in his uh, renal profile. And Dr. Prasad, uh, two questions to you. Is this cardiorenal syndrome? And how do you explain the deterioration and subsequent improvement of the renal function in this patient? Um. Thanks, Kanan. Uh, well, obviously, if you look at the creatinine, you can see it's going up from 150 right up to 300, but the EGFR dropped uh, a fair bit, you know. And then it, with the improvement of heart function and his settling down of his heart rhythm, uh, his kidney function has actually improved. Although uh, normally, uh, if you look at the literature, they say when the kidney function drops this much, the prognosis is poorer in the long term, as well as uh, the hospitalization time, etc., is longer. But this gentleman, I remember him, uh, he did pretty well. So this is, in a way, an example of the cardiorenal syndrome. And uh, can I have the next slide? Have I written something? 
yeah when you have a worsening heart failure there's a worsening renal function but heart failure got better the heart rhythm uh, or heart tachycardia got better and the renal function subsequently improved okay this patient has been followed up up to now he was last seen in the clinic in january of this year this one year one year after his acute admission he has remained free of heart failure symptoms and has remained in sinus rhythm during each of his visits we thought that non compliance to medication and this man has a history of stopping medicines whenever he feels well uh, in the past was a possible contributor to his hemodynamic dysfunction his current medications just include this bisoprol 1.25 mg once a day is a beta blocker propitagrel uh, as an antiplatelet agent uh, furosemide and warfarin uh, we are not able to use the new direct and uh, acting anticoagulants because of his renal impairment and with this he's been well dr tamrus uh, in this patient deterioration in left ventricular function was attributed to tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy due to silent atrial fib which was which he was not aware of uh, could you explain to us briefly what tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy is uh, okay so generally briefly it's basically a cardiomyopathy related to persistently elevated heart rate and you can actually only confirm the diagnosis if you bring down the heart rate and then the heart function recovers you know a few months or a few years later uh, basically it's a diagnosis of uh, exclusion whenever people come with heart failure dilated and there's no obvious cause for it this is one of the things that you have to think about whether they have tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy recently it has also been shown to be related to frequent ventricular atypics so not just you know fast heart rate uh, supraventricular tachycardia if you have a lot of pvcs you know ventricular atypics it can also contribute to this uh, condition thank you uh, dr shamrus um okay Th that's the conclusion of the three cases we have i'm glad that we could complete the cases because i know you all are interested in case histories so some some questions and then we'll take your own questions dr shamrus uh, very quickly what are the basic investigations that will aid you in the assessment of a patient with uh, cardio renal syndrome when you always start with the basic you know blood test you know specifically to the cardiac side of things you know i probably do a proponin uh, probe mp to give prognostication uh, for this patient but other other things like risk factors you know diabetes lipids you need to know that as well ecg uh, echo you know can show evidence for uremic cardiomyopathy whether they have any left ventricular hypertrophy what's the lv systolic dysfunction what's the lv diastolic function whether they have any pericardial effusion uh, such as shown in one of these patients uh, you know you can also go uh, very advanced you know but i think the basics will do, uh, i'll do that at the moment okay good thank you shamrus dr prasad what about you right uh, basically when you talk about cardio renal syndrome you are assuming the, the the kidneys are actually normal but have failed because of the heart so you want you in a so when you say cardio renal you will want to rule out any intrinsic uh, kidney disease so you like to do a blood creatinine level or cystatin c whichever you want to do to look at a kidney function initially and then you like to do a urine test if they see if the urine test is abnormal if it's got a lot of proteinuria and microscopic hematuria you may want to think he's got a uh, some renal uh, disease as well and of course an ultrasonography of the kidney is important to see the size of the kidneys if the kidneys are whether they're shrunken or not so some of the basic investigations we do just to aid us in our management of the cardio renal syndrome thank you professor Dr. Shambhus, is there a role for cardiac MRI in the assessment of uremic cardiomyopathy? Okay. I mean, cardiac MRI as a whole, as an imaging uh, in relation to cardiovascular disease, I mean, it's being used more and more. But the problems in uh, advanced kidney disease, you have the risk of uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis when you use the contrast that we normally use in cardiac MRI. Um, you can use it to assess for LV hypertrophy, LV volume, LV size, uh, global uh, strain. But specifically, when you do MRI, you really want to know information about myocardial fibrosis, which we normally use gadolinium in non-kidney patients. 
But nowadays, I mean, there have been certain techniques, non-contrast cardiac MRI techniques that use uh, T2 and T1 mapping to give some ideas about uh, load of fibrosis in especially patients with uremic cardiomyopathy. But, you know, we're still waiting for more data and correlation with histological findings and prognostic value to actually really push it uh, as a mainstream usage. Thank you, Shamrus. Uh, so not confirming, uh, not conferring long-term prognostic benefit, diuretics pro provide uh, symptomatic relief in heart failure and cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, they are important in, uh, in our armamentarium in the treatment of patients with acute as well as chronic heart failure. Dr. Prasad, why are intravenous diuretics more effective than oral treatment in decompensated heart failure? The answer is pretty obvious. If the intravenous diuretics, you do not worry about the bioavailability of that drug. Now, if you look at a slide here, you see that frusamide has a bioavailability of 40%. Bumitanide or Burinex, which is easily available in Malaysia, has a bioavailability of 80%. Now, tosamide has an even better uh, bioavailability, but it's not easily available in Malaysia. So let's stick to the first two. So in your patients, for example, who has got gut edema, either due to chronic heart failure or even due to nephrotic syndrome or any other cause, you find that the absorption of bumitanide is much better than frusamide. So if there's any reason to suspect the uh, absorption is going to be compromised, it's better to use this. Now, of course, when you use IV drugs, there's absolutely no question of bioavailability. And in the DOSE trial, they, where they compared intravenous versus inf infusion, they said always use a higher dose. Like the patient is, who comes in is on oral frusamide, for example, when you use, you must use a high intensity, you must use at least 2.5 times the oral dose. In this trial, particular trial, they say there was not much difference between giving bolus, intermittent bolus doses versus infusion, but there are many other trials which showed that the intravenous infusion is, and including a Cochrane review, we showed the intravenous infusion is probably more effective. Thank you, Prasad. Uh, Dr. Prasad, can you tell us something about ultra, uh, ultra filtration and when when you would consider using it in cardiorenal syndrome? Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is one paper that was, uh, there are many papers. This is the UNLO trial. There's also a Rose Heart Failure trial, uh, the CARES trial, where they looked at the use of uh, ultra filtration versus intravenous diuretics. Um, to be honest, my own preference is always to go with intravenous diuretics because firstly, it's non-invasive. Uh, you do not have uh, you do not have to put a catheter, you don't have to put them up to a machine. And and you can do you can do a if the patient of course the patient has very high urea and creatinine and the diuretics don't work or not expected to work, then you can start ultrafiltration early. But otherwise, if the re if the renal function is reasonable, I would always suggest go with intravenous diuretics first. And only if they don't respond, then you can uh, go and uh, you can do ultra filtration. You have to put in a central catheter, hook them up to one of your machines, and then ultra filtrate the water. It works very well, provided the blood pressure holds. Thanks, Prasad. Dr. Shambrus, can you advise us about what drugs will bring about prognostic benefit in cardiovascular syndrome? Uh, maybe Prasad can add to this later. But I mean, generally in the past, we know about um, ACE inhibitors, A2RBs, they've been shown to reduce rate of progression of uh, renal loss as well as proteinuria. Uh, but nowadays, you know, things like STLT2 inhibitors, uh, RNA, I think we still need more data about these uh, latest two medications, uh, especially in regards to kidney failure. Uh, but I think the established ones like ACE, uh, A2RB, certainly a lot of people are using at the moment. Maybe Prasad can comment about the usage of these medications in advanced CKD. I know it's chronic CKD, we, we, we do it, but in advanced CKD, I think there's still some questions about ACE, ARB, you know, especially the latest two, and Tresto and SDLT2 as well. Right. Uh, yeah, I agree with Shamrus. I mean, a bit, the, the most important drug that you want to talk about, again, is the use of diuretic. There's a, the, the mainstay. Now, use, as I saw earlier in the slide, 
we, they, we talked about uh, activation of the renin, angiotensin, and the aldosterone system. And Shamal is absolutely right. You want to block the activation of this system because it gives you prognostic benefits. Okay. Um, and um, you, the caveat to using it is number one, if there's hyperkalemia. I mean, if you've got high potassium, you've got to start worrying about whether you want to start an ASA or ARP. Um, otherwise, there's actually not much. You know, when you start an ACE and ARB, we know that the kidney function will deteriorate a little bit. That's the way it works. So if you are very worried about that or you find that they are tottering or teetering on the age of dialysis, you may not want to use it. Otherwise, yes, you want to block the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system. But keep in mind the potassium level. Mineral corticoid receptor antagonists have about the same role. Again, you've got to worry about the potassium. Okay, thank Can you. I... Uh, we'll move on because we want to give the audience a chance to uh, ask some questions. Now, quickly, um, this always troubles me in some of our patients, cardiovascular syndrome, where we see symptomatic and hemodynamic benefit with the ACE inhibitors or RNA we find that uh, there is a rise in potassium to 5.5 to 6 millimoles. So what should we do, Prasad? Should we stop the ACE inhibitors? Should we stop arginine? What options do we have? Well, as I've mentioned, that the EGFR is going to drop by 20%. That's the way it works. If it drops more than 30%, uh, okay, then you have to be worried. You have to either reduce the uh, dose of the drug or if the patient is on a small dose, then you have to stop it. Hyperkalemia is something that you, we don't want to fool around with. You know that you know the patient can get go into an arrhythmia or whatever in the middle of the night. So if your potassium is high, you have to again reduce or even stop the drug. Treating them with, um, um, there is an option of treating them with uh, what you call a potassium binder. Uh, but uh, how long, the question again comes, how long do you want to treat them? So, and so uh, the, the, some of the experts in the field say it all depends on how important the ACE or ARNI or etc. is in these patients. And then you can give them a small dose of potassium binder. But generally, I rather vary of treating the side effect of one drug with another drug and then a, a side effect of that drug with the third drug and so on and so forth. Yeah, but... Just to emphasize the last point, I mean, you are the one who taught me about using uh, a resin to bind potassium. And there have been a few of our patients where uh, introduction of RNA certainly led to improvement in renal function, but we had to uh, worry about the potassium. But when we gave them regular uh, resin, uh, we are able to contribute a drug to their benefit. But of course, we monitor their potassium levels closely. Sure. Okay. I think maybe we should move on. Uh, uh, we will forgo this last question, Dr. Shambhu, so that the audience can ask some questions. We have got, I think, another five to six minutes left. Do you have questions, Alan? Two questions, yes. I can't see them. So. Yes, you have. Yes, we are ready to move on. Yeah. Question is, uh, is renal failure and heart failure the feature of uh, post-COVID symptoms? Uh, both of you heard that, Prasad and uh, Shamrus. <laughs> okay. Um, the Shamrus, you want to take it first? Uh, I'm no expert in COVID, to be honest. Uh, None of us are. All of us are learning. I mean... I mean, we're talking about COVID generally. I mean, there have been data to show that they can cause heart failure. And in any sepsis, you can have the risk of having renal failure. Uh, but whether it's a regular feature of most <laughs> system, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I understand this question. I mean, during the COVID, acute COVID, uh, um, what do you call it, illness, the, the kidney function has been shown to deteriorate. There are a few patients with, who have got advanced CKD who actually uh, needed dialysis during the uh, acute illness. But in the post-COVID state, um, the ones that who have my patients who have actually recovered from COVID 
they actually kidney function actually if you remember the first patient in SGMC who was in bitter sungai bulu his uh, over time his function has actually improved and it's actually done extremely well so i'm not sure I, more than that i really can't say much i was generally speaking that a subset of patients who develop covid especially stage 4 and higher uh, uh, levels of covid uh, can develop uh, cardiac failure due to various conditions uh, from myocardial infarction to myocarditis etc and uh, then they can develop renal failure due to various reasons because of severe heart failure sepsis so on and so forth i mean that subset exists we know uh, i think beyond that uh, there's little to say what's the next question uh, adam uh, why no anti ischemic therapy for patient number 1 uh no anti ischemic okay uh, there was a good there was good question we put him on uh, beta blockers and uh, i don't know whether we mentioned that and with with a beta blocker treatment alone uh, he is uh, angina was controlled we are asking whether we gave him uh, statins yes we did yeah, did we give him uh, anti pill agents yes we did we, we, i didn't put it up in the slide yeah so that one more uh, more of comment rather than question from slido and uh, that is uh, i'm glad you stressed on the need for long term diuretic therapy I'll be at a small and a low dose in addition to the other drugs. I, I, I mean, when we treat somebody with heart failure, it's not just talk about cardiorenal syndrome, uh, which we all of them, in spite of the advances, require some diuretics to get them to be comfortable. But as you treat them, especially with modern day drugs, now we have got so many of them. You know, we have got the we have got Arni, we have got Spinal. Uh, we have got beta blockers, and then now we have got SGLT2. Uh, we find that as we uh, uh, follow them up, uh, we can wean some of them, some of them off diuretics. So the important thing here is, yes, we have to give them diuretics. Don't give excessive amount of diuretics, but also observe your patients because some of them can be taken off diuretics. Diuretics provide symptomatic benefit; they do not uh, give you any prognostic benefit. Uh, Those are the comments I would like to make. Kanan, can I just ask you and Shamru sure. a question? Yeah, now with knowing that SGLT2 is a it's itself a natriuretic agent. If the patient yes. needs only a small dose of uh, diuretic, is it kosher or is it correct to use a uh, uh, SGLT2 instead? Yes, I mean if you look at the current European Society guidelines, the first first two drugs they ask you to in, uh, to give someone in heart failure is actually a SGLT2 inhibitor and ARNI. Uh, your your beta blockers have now been uh, relegated to second place. Of course, cost is an issue. I mean, ARNI is quite expensive, and if you follow the guidelines, you're supposed to use up to 200 milligrams twice a day. You know, so that's that's expensive. SGLT2 inhibitors are not cheap either, so cost becomes a bit of an issue when it comes to treat these patients. But uh, it, uh, with the use of modern day drugs. You can liberate patients from diuretics, and diuretics have got their own issues. You know, you cause uh, electrolyte imbalances, can cause hemodynamic problems because of excessive diuresis, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in terms of foundational class of medications for heart failure, it's actually a beta blocker, uh, Arni. Uh, if they cannot tolerate Arni, then ACE or ARB. Then you can go SGLT2 inhibitors, and then you can put. Mineral corticoid inhibitors. So actually, in the guideline, the loop diuretics is as per patient's clinical condition. If they don't need it, you don't have to carry on with it. Okay. Okay. Then, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you all have a good weekend. I think the most important part of the session is coming up. Alan is going to put up the. Uh, logo is it? Uh, Adam, to claim points. Yeah, to claim points. Uh, please uh, use the MMA app and uh, click on the scan QR section, 
and I'll show you the QR code now. I can't get so you can close your presentation. Oh. Okay. So working for everyone, please uh, give us some feedback in your comments. Uh, if you're watching in YouTube, uh, please do us a favor and like this video, please. Like the video, uh, subscribe to our channel. Feel free to share the video with your colleagues. You know, if you find it educational. All right. Okay. Everyone got their point? I'll leave it on for a while. <clears throat> what happened to my MMA code disappeared? Mine has elapsed. <laughs> oh, the scan button is now at the bottom in the latest app, yeah? Okay. It's not at the top. So, so if you look at the MMA app, you open it, you get the dashboard, the scan is at the bottom and at the bottom. Yeah, I'm working. Yeah, I'm working. Let's take the point. And you might have to be done with it. I don't know what happened to my MMA. Oh, okay. Oh, um, there's something else. Yeah, there's something else. Enjoy your session. Very interesting cases. Thank you all. Facebook. Stop yeah. Facebook. Yeah. If you are uh, watching in our uh, 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 no, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good, have a good weekend, weekend, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. So she will get the speaker's point first. Here we can only get the attendance point. Right?